There is a saying, sometimes it is better to ask for forgiveness rather than permission. That saying sometimes goes into the mind of scientists, which can go one of two ways, either really good or really bad. One such time when scientists rolled the dice would be in the beginning of World War II, when a group of scientists decided it'd be a good idea to put a nuke under a stadium in the city of Chicago. No, this isn't about the Batman movie. This actually happened. This is the tale of Chicago Pile 1. Our telling of this story begins in the 1930s, when the science of nuclear physics is in its infancy. Scientists are making discoveries. We are learning about the fascinating world of decaying atoms and splitting them ourselves. Exploration of this godlike technology brings hope, discovery, and inspiration. Unfortunately, at the time, not all scientists and governments were working in the nuclear field with the best intentions. A political party in Germany called the Nazis, you may have heard of them, were working on splitting the atom. This idea and knowledge scared many other scientists all over the world. A few of them decided to take it upon themselves to try to beat the Nazis and to personally write to the President of the United States at the time, President Franklin D. Roosevelt. In August 1939, a small group of scientists wrote to the President a warning of the potential power the Nazis could conjure if they were to harness the power of the atom. Rather than ignoring the warnings of the scientists, FDR decided to believe them and to fund them. To have American scientists reach the power of the atom before the Axis powers do. I want to point out that the scientists who wrote to the president be wrote it before even the Nazis invaded Poland. So they knew what laid on the horizon. And now with the scientists backed with the government, had the funding, the grasp and advancements of nuclear power was truly beginning. Now, when you start a project, and especially one as monumental as this, two big questions arise to get started. Who do you bring on to the project? And where do you build the project? The government, being actually efficient at the time, decided to try to kill two birds with one stone. Luckily, with nuclear physics being so new, not many scientists were researching it, so that helps lower the number of possible candidates. And, to the government's luck, many of the scientists and mathematicians who would be capable to help on this project would already live and work in one location, the city of Chicago. <laughs> Boy, how things have changed. So in April 1941, the government decided to set up shop at the University of Chicago under the control of the National Defense Research Committee who at the time, the chairman would be James Conant, who would sometimes go by Jim. The project would be led by Arthur Holly Compton as a sort of overseer, in other words, but the big names, the heavy hitters, would be Leo Zillard, Walter Zinn, Liana Woods, and the Wonder Boy, Enrico Fermi. There'd be hundreds of people working on this project, but many would not know the full picture. They'd be kept in the dark for security reasons. The reason why I chose those names as the heavy hitters is because, well, Leo Zillard would be the first scientist to conceive of nuclear chain reaction and with Eugene Winger and Edward Teller help convince Albert Einstein to write to the President of the United States with them to warn and to get the project off the ground. Walter Zinn, his contributions throughout his entire life helped the growth of nuclear reactors immensely. Yana Woods, one of the smartest scientists who may eventually get her own episode, was a master with analysis equipment and nuclear analysis. And all the way at the very top, the leading scientist, the mastermind, Enrico Fermi. A Nobel Prize winner, even before taking on this project. A man ahead of his time, 
who helped bring theory to life and explored and expanded the world of particles like we've never seen before. A genius, to put it simply. This Italian scientist who fled to America with his wife would become one of America's brightest scientists for decades to come and be one badass scientist. The plan with the government and the scientists was to take the theory of nuclear reaction and bring it into practical, no longer just equations on a chalkboard, but to create the first nuclear reactor. The main difference between what they wanted to do and say a nuclear bomb is one supposed to detonate, the other is not. Both kind of work on similar principles, but that's details for another time. With the team assembled and the green light, quickly the scientists and mathematicians gathered and work began. Work to figure out the math, the physics, the engineering to build a machine to tear apart atoms. Something like this is quite overwhelming for me to think, even with my engineering background. It is one thing to be the first or to improve on something, but to be the first to make a nuclear reactor is just its own category in itself. For months, this team of scientists grinded out calculations, blueprints, and research. An important note, even though the government set up shop at the University of Chicago, they only plan to do small experiments and to do the math behind a nuclear reactor at the university. The team working on the project called their area the Metallurgy Laboratory. The actual large-scale testing, otherwise known as doing the actual test, they would want to build a facility in Redgate's Woods to do the actual test. Redgate Woods is a forest preserve just outside the city of Chicago. Only a small hiccup would occur. Just, just a little one. A strike. A strike by the builders who were meant to build a facility for the actual testing. This is a little bit of a hiccup. Because now you have no builders and you have no building. Things would have to pivot and fast. So quickly, people began to look for a new spot to build a nuclear reactor. Something no one has ever done before. That is very dangerous. And it's not exactly the smallest thing. That's when someone came up with the fantastic idea of a location to build it. You see, there was a spot very close to the scientist, very exclusive, and for the most part, abandoned. It would fit their dimensions needed to build this reactor, and it would be right underneath their noses. Literally underneath their noses, not figuratively. Under the stands of Stag Field, the stands to the football field for the University of Chicago, was a squash court. This was abandoned. No one used it. Spiderwebs, cobwebs, fallen apart. God knows how long it's been since it's been used. And for the majority of the people who will not know, because I have no idea and I'm from Chicago, Stag Field of the University of Chicago at the time was located at the heart of Chicago next to Lake Michigan. So you have a location where you want to build a secret nuclear reactor. It's just under one of the world's most populated cities next to one of the biggest freshwater lakes in the world. And you have a bunch of college students walking around just above you. I don't see anything that could possibly go wrong with this scenario. Now here's where the story gets funny to me. At first, Compton, the leader of the project, was hesitant to build a secret nuclear reactor under a, under a football stadium at a university, for obvious reasons. But the genius that Fermi was simply convinced him that his math was right and it would be perfectly fine to build it under a stadium, saying to Compton that there was only a small chance of things going wrong. I guess it was enough to convince Compton he gave it the okay. Construction soon began, and with the builders being on strike, the team had to get a little creative with the manual labor to prep the squash court for the reactor. Apparently, and take this with a grain of salt, I could not confirm this, they somehow convinced the students at that university to help demo and renovate the squash court. The students weren't building any of the important work, the whole top secret thing, but apparently helped with removing walls, old equipment, etc, etc. The labor of the important parts, such as the graphite and uranium, would be carried out by members with security clearance and be part of the team. And 
you may be thinking to yourself, don't they need permission or notify someone that they are moving build sites of a nuclear reactor and putting it under a college in a heavy, dense, populated city? You would think so, but you'd be wrong. Everyone just kept their mouths shut. Compton never told the dean of the university. Whether the dean knew is another thing. If I had to guess, he knew something was up, but not knowing makes a great deniability if anyone asks. Compton also thought if he asked the dean, the dean would say no. Sometimes you ask for forgiveness, not permission. Funny enough, also, everyone working on the project from James Continent, the National Defense Research Chairman, all the way down to the scientists working on the project and everyone in between, also decided not to tell the mayor of Chicago at the time, the governor of Illinois, or any Illinois politician for that fact. Man, those scientists are extremely smart. They're able to build a nuclear reactor and they know not to tell the politicians. Ugh, ingenious. Now, with the equations made, it was time to build. From November 16th to December 1st, 1942, they built the reactor. The reactor would weigh tons and tons, being again mainly made up of graphite and uranium. It would be 20 feet wide, 25 feet high. The reactor would be given the name Chicago Pile 1. Why Chicago Pile 1, you might ask? That has to do with three simple things. One, it took place in Chicago. Simple enough. Two, it has to do with earlier experiments conducted on nuclear reactions. You see, in 1939 at Columbia University, they used chain reactions, quote unquote piles, to measure emission from fission. Fission, just radioactive material decaying, kind of what how nuclear reactors work. Funny enough, the team that worked on that all ended up working on Chicago Pile 1. Again, small field for the time. And lastly, the one in Chicago Pile 1, it was simply the fact, it was the first one. The first nuclear reactor. Hence, one. But with Chicago Pile 1 being completed, but with Chicago Pile 1 being completed on December 1st, you know what comes after December 1st. That's right, December 2nd. Let's turn this baby on. So on December 2nd, 1942, at 3.25 p.m., 49 scientists gathered in the former squash court, now filled with graphite and uranium, to start the world's first nuclear reactor. I want to point out that no one in this room was wearing or had protective gear while starting this bad boy up. Oh, the days before OSHA. Slowly, one by one, they were moving cadmium rods. The cadmium rods in this nuclear reactor act as a stabilizer by absorbing the neutrons. But the goal is not to absorb the neutrons, but to have the radioactive material start a reaction and keep the reaction going by itself. So the rods have to go. The safety has to come out. Minute by minute, rod by rod, they slowly started to bring the nuclear reaction up to the critical point. After 15 long minutes, all the rods were finally removed. Now everyone in the room simply had to stand there and wait. It is hard to fathom the anticipation, excitement, and fear that had to be in that room. People had to be sweating, because if they messed up, it wouldn't be like a nuclear bomb going off, but it could be just as devastating, contaminating the area, easily leaking into Lake Michigan, ruining generations and generations of lives. Apparently, while almost everyone was biting their nails, Fermi, that Italian madman, was relaxed and as cool as a cucumber. Either he was super convinced his math was right, or he is someone I would never want to play poker against. After 28 minutes of waiting, watching the reactor rise, and everyone holding their breath, the measuring equipment started to come alive and read the numbers that many were wondering if they would ever come. And at 3.53 p.m. December 2nd, 1942, the first self-sustaining nuclear chain reaction had happened. 
the atom was now becoming under control by mankind. And you know I know how they celebrated? With booze, of course. Specifically, a bottle of Chiantier, where someone in the room took off the wrapper from the bottle and had everyone sign it to help commemorate this amazing day. That wrapper still exists today. Compton would then contact the chairman of the National Defense Research Committee, James Conant, remember that guy from the beginning, and they would have an interesting conversation about this secretive project. It would go like this. Jim, you'll be interested to know the Italian navigator has just landed in the New World. The Earth is not as large as we estimated. He arrived at the New World sooner than expected. Is that so? Were the natives friendly? Everyone landed safe and happy. That was the conversation. Now, with all the success, a new problem arose. What to do with a nuclear reactor under a college in the city of Chicago next to a major water supply? You can't be just like Ohio and dump it into the river. Sorry, Ohio, low blow. And just by circumstance, somehow, just because, luckily, just by circumstance, and what do you know, Somehow, after the experiment was a success, the government found some money to have all the workers paid and build a building in the original spot in the Red Gates Woods. Interesting how that happens. Once the new building was up, all the materials were moved, and Chicago Pile 2 was born. This new location would help bring in an investment and investigation into atomic energy and help the first national laboratory form the Argonne National Lab, which I'm a little biased simply because they did not hire me after interviewing me, but boy do they do some amazing work and are filled with incredible scientists even to this day. With Chicago Pile 1 being a proof of concept, new reactors across the country started to get made. Now, all across the country, since they're not building them in cities anymore, could be bigger. And bigger reactors were needed to help create the right type of plutonium and uranium. The right type for what, you may ask? Oh, just the right type you need for nuclear bombs and a little project called the Manhattan Project. You see, the Manhattan Project may have never happened if it wasn't for a bunch of scientists working in secret under the city of Chicago, playing around with radioactive material with sort of permission and also sort of not permission as for the original build site once done with chicago pile one the squash court turned nuclear reactor room was eventually dismantled and now replaced with a library which still stands today all that remains to this location is a bronze sculpture and a plaque to commemorate chicago pile one and for chicago pile two Eventually, that building was demolished and moved. And all that stands of that original building is a plaque off a non-paved trail in the same forest. I think this story tells a lot. Trusting yourself, rolling the dice, and perhaps the most important lesson. <laughs> that sometimes it's better to ask for forgiveness than to ask for permission. But this is a tale I wanted to tell. Chicago Pile 1, a group of scientists who come from all different backgrounds, coming together to work in a secret place that they probably shouldn't have. They paved the road, not just for the Manhattan Project, not just for Argonne National Lab, but for all nuclear energy inventions to come. These people were the pioneers. They laid groundworks, not for just generations, but for all of humanity. Many people only know about the nuclear project, the Manhattan Project, to make the bombs but that project was built on other people's shoulders it took a community tons of scientists tons of research to get to that point and i think it's important to tell the story of chicago pile one so next time you're walking down the street just think there could be crazy experiments like a nuclear reactor right under your feet and with that being said thank you all for listening